Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Yes, not a very well-known poet, what I would call today maybe one of the minor poets. But some of his poem has given us codes to remember. So what's the age that I'm talking about, the Victorian age? We have looked at a poet called Browning, Robert Browning, you might remember, who also belonged to the Victorian age. Queen Victoria ruled on and on for more than 50 years. And as far as literature is concerned, it was really an age when you had the novel with novelists like Dickens and Thackeray. And then we do have essays with essays like John Ruskin and Carlyle. And then we come on to the poets like Tennyson and Browning and Arnold. So that is the literature of the Victorian age. Also, interestingly, you have new genres in poetry like the dramatic monologue, which was popularized by Robert Browning. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1807 to 1882. A minor poet, of course, but one of the best loved American poets of that period. He has been honored in the Poets' Corner of Westminster Abbey. Fictional prose, non-fictional prose and poetry, he wrote all of these. He himself said once, my poetry is actually more imitative than imaginative. I don't know whether that is the truth or it is the humility of the poet saying that. Remember, I'm talking about the Victorian age and an American poet. Hardly matters because we are looking at English poetry. He wrote a prose piece called Hyperion before he moved on to poetry in a big way. His anthology is called Voices of the Night. He also wrote Evangeline, a verse romance. And interestingly, he wrote essays in, and I'm repeating, in French and Spanish and Italian also. He was a European, can we call it, a wanderer, because he loved talking about other countries, other languages too. I believe he even learned the Scandinavian language. A Psalm of Life. There is a subtitle too, but let me first tell you what a psalm means. I'm sure most of you know that it is a biblical song and we talk about the psalms that are recited, that are sung. So this poem is called A Psalm of Life. What the heart of the young man said to the psalmist. Very interesting, it's the heart, not the head, which is talking to the psalmist. Let me begin by reading the poem. Slightly longish poem, but a very interesting poem. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. And then the reply is, life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust thou returnest, was not spoken of the soul. I hope you can see the point of discussion here. You have the psalmist who is telling you, well, all loads read to the grave, maybe. But then there is the heart here which is saying, no, this is not about the soul. Maybe the body goes to the grave. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way. Still, like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero 
in the strife. You know, there's something about that phrase, Kapi Deel. Hold on to the moment, live life in the moment. That is what the narrator believes as he is answering the questions of the psalmist. The psalmist goes on and on about the importance of this life only being that it leads us towards our death. But the person who is speaking, the narrator, does not believe that. And then my favorite lines, my favorite verse, if you please. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. I think most of you would recollect that this was a phrase, a stanza, which has been quoted time and again, maybe by our teachers, maybe by our parents. What do we learn from great people? Departing, leave behind footprints on the sands of time. We have to be remembered. If you've really lived a great life, you will be remembered. But me, let me read another stanza. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God overhead. Don't forget to act. Don't forget why you are on this earth just by thinking about death and what awaits us after death. To go back to the footprints, footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seen shall take heart again. So what is the advice? What does the poem end with? Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. We have to continue acting. That is the message of the poem. That is the moral. That is the takeaway that Longfellow leaves for us as he answers all that the psalmist has to say about life. As we read each poem, probably you too have begun doing what I do and I continue doing and that is looking for figures of speech. Fortunately or unfortunately, some figures of speech are oft repeated because that is what adds to the beauty of any language. Don't we all use similes all the time? as cold as snow, as white as milk, as cunning as a fox, and so on and on. So we have the similar simile. And then we have the metaphor. Remember, a slightly tougher one, because you do not have words like as and like, but you still have the comparison when you say he is a lion, instead of saying he is as brave as a lion. Let me go on to personification, which again, you know, is where we have human attributes to non-human inanimate objects. And then you have illusion, where you refer to something else which is outside the work. And then how can one forget the importance of sound, alliteration? I'm saying all these words again without giving you examples from the poem. Because that is the fun part of reading a poem. When you look at a poem and you say, wow, this is alliteration. So I hope you'll be able to do it as you read through this poem. The poem has a message, but the poem has beauty too in the use of these figures of speech. I love poetry. And when I say poetry, what am I talking about? Am I talking about poems which were written 2000 years ago and I read them in translation? Or am I talking about poetry which was written just yesterday in this contemporary world, in the society in which I live and therefore much easier for me to understand? I think of myself as somebody, a diver, a pearl diver, diving into the bed of the ocean, looking for that, that pearl, which probably is the best that man has found so far. 
That's what I do with poetry too. And when I look at this poem, why do I like this poem? I love it when he says, lives of great men all remind us. How I wish I too could leave the footprints on the sands of time. I want you to see how beautiful it is when he talks about the sands of time. You know, another poet had talked to us about how when you write it on water, it disappears. But when you write it on stone, it lasts forever. I'm looking at the imagery as I walk along the seashore on the beach. And I love that. You know, when my feet go into that soft sand and I have to pull it up again. So this poem is like that. Oh yes, I know my soul is important, but I know my body is equally important because that is the life that I'm living. Do I make sense as to why I love poetry? Why I love this poem? I hope you to love listening to it and then going back and probably reading it too. And please remember to read each poem aloud for yourself. I don't mean loudly so that your neighbors are disturbed, but read it aloud so that you enjoy the sound of the poem as much as the sense of the poem.